priorities and planning with the provincial government. In terms of this interview, I've been involved from the beginning with the, the establishment of uh, Didatzitsa, the, the Clinical Research and Training Institute. That was, uh, we developed terms of reference in, in 2013, I believe it was, and it was uh, established by the chiefs. And it, it has done uh, a variety of, act made a variety of activities and, and involved in a variety of things in those years. Uh, it hasn't been consistent. We haven't. Uh, we've kind of gone up and down, based on uh, the the intention is to to situate the research and training institute right within the provincial government, and uh, so we've had to go through processes of of setting up various departments in the government and restructuring and so on to allow that to happen, and that's still underway. But the the purpose of the research institute, or, or just even the focus on research, was that there were all of these different activities that were going on in various places. Some of them were being done well, some of them were dying. All of them were important. And so there was uh, research happening within the region, primarily with the, the, the I shouldn't say primarily, but largely with the the Clinical Community Services Agency. I had been involved with that, and we had been doing uh, significant research there within the education side of things, and also with health and social services. So um, we had set up groups. I don't know if you've ever heard of things like the CART team, which was a community action research team of young people that were working specifically on health issues in, in the region. And uh, we had also uh, set up groups of elders that were uh, advising in some of the work and some of the work was was tremendously successful there were two uh, on the health side of things there was um, stra a community based strategy dealing with with uh, sexually transmitted infections prior to foxy in fact i think foxy in some ways may have been based on many of the things that were happening in the clinical region and very dramatic success rates in terms of what happened there. There was another, uh, many of the activities there which were based on indigenous models of, of research uh, that involved elders, that involved um, uh, action research methods within the community. Uh, they were applied again to another infection in the communities and uh, very dramatic uh, uh, decline. So the methodologies were sound. Um, other things that we were doing with research at that time were developing a dictionary and working with University of Victoria on the development of the Clinchell Dictionary. Uh, Treaty 11, which was the predecessor to the Clinchell government, had been doing uh, caribou work. They had been doing uh, different activities with elders and so on. So there were all of these research activities that were basically projects. They weren't part of a of an ongoing, systematic, well-funded uh, uh, activity. So we needed to deal with that. And, and research seemed like a, a, superb, um, a superb activity, primarily because uh, in terms of your interest with education and Indigenous education, it's a wonderful way to, when you, when you look at, at uh, the methodologies of working through research questions and so on. It's a wonderful way to get out in the land with young people and elders. And, and so research actually becomes a model of, of, of a strategy that you can use to further the goals of the clinical government, which are to do those kinds of things. So we've had, um, uh, just for instance, one of the, the, the big research movements at the moment is what's called our Boots on the Ground group, which have, uh, have um, been going the last few years, funded by mines, funded by uh, different governmental groups and the clinical government, uh, to get elders out on the land and collect traditional knowledge related to caribou. And so each summer you'll get groups of elders to go out We'll have groups of, of clinical youth going out with them. And so it's just a wonderful way to, to, to connect uh, all of those pieces and then also end up with a, 
with uh, with a research at the end, a research report at the end of it. So <clears throat> those were some elements of what the research institute was was meant to do. Um, if for years and years there had been uh, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of audio tapes of of uh, Clincho elders that had been collected over any number of years, and there was a pro there was a a real uh, need to get rid of those audio t or digitize those audio tapes and get them preserved and and protected. So there were various activities and strategies done to do that, and now we've got a. a a very basic digital archives going. It's got thousands of photographs, thousands of uh, hundreds of video and film pieces dating back right into the 1930s actually, and books and documents and also these audio tapes that are digitized. And uh, that's another piece of, of what's intended to be the Research Institute. And the basis for all of that material is, is, is an educational basis in the sense that uh, the materials can be a foundation for the development of educational materials and so on that go into the schools. So for instance we have a grade 12 uh, a course that was developed by the Clincho government for the high schools about the land claim and uh, the land claim settlement in the, in the region and it uses a lot of the materials that were in the digital archives and so on. So you've got those things, you've also got research that's happening from corporations and institutions across the country and they're looking for science licenses and approvals so they go through Aurora Research Institute and we see it and it enables us to connect with other researchers that have things that they want to do. But all of these these activities have been going on the last couple of years and and in some ways it's it's exploded in the sense that because of the health research that I talked to you about, we put in proposals to Canadian Institute of, of Health Research and won a multi-year, multi-million dollar uh, research grant for what it's being called uh, Hotiseda here, which is here, here and uh, uh, we've got funding to actually help with uh, uh, promote health uh, research all through the territories, but it's actually vested and nested within the Clincho government. Uh, John's probably talked to you about the land claim one too, that we, we it's again another multi-million dollar, multi-year project uh, focused on land claims and so on. So there's a lot of activities that are going on and, and it's kind of an exciting time. You ask what's what's the age group or target audience? Yeah, so if you could just um, describe within the program what are your um, age group and target audience and sort of what the aim of the program is with that audience. Well, I, I think generally the Clinchell government, the chiefs have goals that they want as many people out on the land as much as possible living traditional lives and they want young people to be connected with elders. So... Uh, whatever age you can get people out. I mean, the, the research projects that we do, they tend to be um, high, high school and university students that, that are going out um, with elders. Um, I think I kind of talked about what happens when aims and what happens and mm -hmm. how you measure success to, to some degree. Yeah. I think part of it is, is just doing it. Uh, I mean, we need to get people out, and we're, we're told by the chiefs, we're told by elders, get people out on the land, and so just by doing that, it's it's certainly important. We've played around, there's been different research projects over the last few years about uh, Indigenous evaluation and so on. In fact, we even co-sponsored an evaluation conference here this, this spring. And uh, we've done some things in that area, but it's not what I would say that we're actually out there measuring the success of things with, with, with particular uh, uh, materials. So I guess the next one would be, from your perspective, what is Indigenous education? Well, I mean, ideally, Indigenous education would be education that emerges from, 
from culture in the communities with, with language, culture, and way of life. And I think I was at, I, I'd been a teacher here 30 years ago and a principal and a superintendent. And uh, I mean, that's really what the agency was meant to, to, to be all about, the, T, the TCSA. And um, to some extent, it's been done well sometimes over the years, and other times it's been done terribly. And it all depends on who you've got at any given time to, to work with. But uh, clearly, I mean, the communities tell us, the elders in the communities, the chiefs tell us, that languages and language revitalization is absolutely essential. So in the, in the schools, and I don't know if you're meeting with anybody at the TCSA. I have met with Rosa and Lucy. Rosa and Lucy, and uh, I mean, there, there, there's been a lot of work over the years in terms of the development of, mm -hmm. of language amazing. classes and so on, and, and courses for the high school kids and, and credits and, and uh, programs that get kids out on the land and so on. So those, those are the kinds of things that uh, um, uh, the, the school has, has focused on. And again, as I say, it depends very much on who's there and, and uh, how, how much effort is being put into it. The TCSA is, is in between the GNWT and the, and the Clincho government, but it's funded as a public school system under the JNWT. And they're always being told their cupboard is bare. And so for the years that I worked over there, you were always struggling with no money or no resources to do these things, or very little money and resources. And the wonderful thing about the Clincho government these days is that there is significant resources coming here. And it's certainly unique in my career in the North, where you you're working for an organization that actually has the resources to do things. So if you have good ideas, there's a large <laughs> opportunity to get them funded because uh, if the chiefs hear that you want to do something and, and uh, push something forward, uh, there's often money to do it. So in some ways, that takes some of the... Uh, I think the TCSA was more of a leader in the past, but now the Clincho government is getting stronger and building its capacity and is taking over many of the things that, that the TCSA used to do. And part of that has been we've been poaching staff. So, for instance, Tammy Steinwand is our Director of Culture and Lands Protection here, and she was uh, a colleague of Rosa and Lucy's, and, and Anita Daniels is here, and uh, she's a director of our social programs, and she was one of the original CART team members over at the TCSA and work involved in health research and so on over there. Mason Mantla was a student from there. I don't know if you know Mason or have talked to Mason, but uh, he, uh, he was a, uh, a young kid in high school that we, we uh, brought over to the TCSA and trained in, in film and video because we wanted to reach out to young people using that medium. And... Uh, and uh, he's actually become quite a, a, a skilled uh, a filmmaker, and he's back now working with the Clincher government. What would I like to see achieved? It's not for me to say in that sense. We take our direction from the chiefs and elders, and, and their, their goals clearly have been a strong desire to, to build a government that focuses on language, culture, and way of life. And that's not easy in this world. I mean, it's, it's a really difficult thing. And uh, um, when I started teaching in Wati 30-some years ago, all the kids that came to school spoke Clincho. So you'd have little kids coming in kindergarten and grade one, and they were, they were unilingually Clincho. Today it's not the case. And in all of the communities, uh, Clincho is now the second language, if spoken at all. And even in homes where parents speak Clincho and it's the language between the mum and dad, often young people your age won't speak it, even though their parents use it regularly in the home. So those are huge challenges, and they're not, they're not just challenges in this region. I mean, if you go anywhere in the world where there are indigenous people, they're all struggling almost to the same degree with those same issues. And it's, it's, it's something with 
modernity and colonialism and all kinds of issues that cause that. But uh, the Clinch of Government, there's like three to 4,000 people, very small group. But it's exciting because there's so many interesting things to, to, uh, to capture and to have the kids proud of who they are. And I think, I think, if anything, that's what I would love to see achieved if, if I did talk about it. As a, as a young teacher here, I, I started with John uh, Trails of Our Ancestors canoe trips, and those were trips where we bought all of these canoes, we took kids from the school, and we matched them with elders, and we went out on, on canoe trips. And those trips, the original ones anyway, were significant in the sense that I mean, I was on the first two, and and I was gone six weeks with one of them. And that's when you're out on the land for six weeks, it it changes you. You, it's quite an experience. And when you looked at all of the stories that were happening on the land, and the way that things happened, um, I was I you know I was a very cynical uh, sort of person, and you. What's the way to put it? You look at this thing and it was wondrous. It was absolutely wondrous, you know. And if you didn't, if you, you know, I'm not necessarily what I would call a, a spiritual person, but on one of those trips, you know, we had run out of food and uh, there were 30 of us in these, all these canoes. And we had tea and we had porridge. And uh, the elders said, okay, we'll stop and we'll pray for, for food. And so you kind of say, oh, yeah, right, you know, and I'm not a religious person, but you sit there and you respect what they're doing. And they were praying for food and got back in the canoes and went around a corner and there's a moose. And not only did the moose not run away, it came forward. And so when elders talk about that animals give themselves, you can see it. You can see it, mm -hmm. you know, and this elder in, in the canoe pulled out his gun and shot the moose and... They cut it up and butchered it, and people, within an hour, people were eating this meat. And and I think after the weeks on the trail, for a cynical person to look at those things, even though it wasn't necessarily that I would, I believed that, I could see why elders believe those things, because the world was acting the way they said it would, you know? And it it was very powerful. And... For kids to see that, and my own kids are, are clinch of citizens, and for them to see the wonder of, of that side of their culture to me is, is, uh, uh, is a real gift. And so I, I hope it survives, you know, in the next, into the next generation. But it's, you know, it's probably all over the place, and John, I'm not sure, I should have talked to John to see what he was talking about first, but... It's it's exciting, and I think I think one of the neat things about the clinch of government is that because of the resources that are currently here and will be and seem to be continuing to flow, they'll be able to ramp up and and build uh, build things that uh, maybe other groups in the territories that don't have their claims yet can't do. So, for instance, part of the restructuring to hold the the Research Institute was this development of a Department of Culture and Lands Protection. Well, there's over 30 people in that department now, and they're core funded by the Clinchel government. I mean, to me, that's amazing. You know, that's that's a there's something going to happen there, and it's a real, it's 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 a real opportunity to move forward with these things.